Hello, and welcome to, well, what is an experiment, really? I have never recorded a presentation on this software before. I'm using OBS. And I'm not sure if it will work. I'm not sure if it's going to be better than XSplit. But I am reaching a point with XSplit where it is really starting to annoy me, and I'm considering cancelling my subscription, because... I keep having to re-record stuff, it keeps dropping things, and it keeps stalling recordings. I have no idea if this is going to work any better. So I'm saying this up front because I want you to know. And if it's worse, tell me. If it's better, and if it, you think it's a clear image, and if you think things go better, tell me that, because if it is... When I return from the two weeks wandering around for various birthday parties and all the other things I've got going on, I will switch over. And I will work out how to make X uh, OBS my usual up up recording system. I will probably still have to use, uh, use XSplit for my YouTube live videos because I don't want to confuse the two in terms of their settings of looking, uh, uh, linking up with YouTube or linking up with Twitch. But if this is better for recording, then I will do that. So, saying that, the Bitten class. They're cool, aren't they? They are really, really cool. The Bitten class are the foundation for the Royal Navy in terms of anti-submarine warfare in World War II. They are the basis for the requirements which feed into... Flower class corvettes, the uh, the castle class corvettes, they are the hull and basis of the hunt class escort destroyers. They are the basis for the egret class and the modify uh, the black swans, the modified black swans. All of them come back to this class, this one little class of sloops, which are built in 1934, 35, and 36. And when I say built in 1944, 35, and 36, I mean quite literally that. Enchantress is laid down in March 1934. She's launched in December 1934 and is commissioned pretty much bang on uh, April 1935. A year and a month. Oh, it transitioned. Um, a year and a month pretty much to the day from her laying down she is launched and commi uh, she's commissioned I mean uh, she's laid down the night for March and she's commissioned on the 8th April pretty good sorry I was surprised it worked shameless book plug of course um, I am going to be doing something about sloops in terms of books I have got a plan for a similar book to Tribal Battles and Daring's on the bitten eager, uh, bitten's egrets and black swans, but it's trying to do it without also including so much about the hunt class escort destroyers that I end up writing a colossal book about them. And it's whether or not it's actually going to go to publishers or if it's going to be part of the self published group which are going up on e readers. Both are good options. They spread the lud. Oh, they spread the love of the construction of these ships. Uh, John Brown Shipbuilding on Clyde build Enchantress. Uh, William Denny and Brothers build Stork and Dumbarton. And Bidden herself is built by J.S. White and Company in Cows. Why are they spread around? Why do they keep this such a mixture of construction? Well, very simple, really. The Royal Navy wants to have as many yards as possible feeding into their anti-submarine warfare construction capability. One of the really interesting things you have going on in the 1920s, but also um, very much so in the 1930s, is a overt attempt by the Royal Navy within the limitations imposed on them by Treasury and Treaty to inoculate as many skills they need for any future war as possible in the yards. To maintain a capability of construction within the broader British maritime industrial base. 
However, the Royal Navy knows that to do that, they also need to maintain it, the ideas and understanding within the Royal Navy. And so this is one of the reasons why the Royal Navy structures the exercise program the way, it is, uh, way they do. So that it feeds in information at the right point through the year to be fed into the construction program. Everything is worked out very carefully, especially, I would say, from about 1931-32 onwards. Even before Admiral Henderson becomes Third Sea Lord, even before all the various people get into various positions, there is a lot of work going on by very senior Royal Navy Admirals to try and preserve the best experience they can from Model 1, but also move it forward so it understands the best technology of the current era they're in. It doesn't always go to plan. Please note, I'm not saying the Royal Navy was perfect. I, I do love the internet in that sometimes you can be saying something good about some uh, something, and then someone will respond, well, you know, this was also good, or they got this wrong. They did. A very large organization will be able to get things right and things wrong simultaneously. Sometimes they get something right in a way that actually gets it wrong. HMS Enchantress here is a good example. She is the original first member of the class. Honestly, this class should have been named the Enchantress class. Why is it not? Because Enchantress was actually turned into an Admiral's Yacht, and by tradition, the Admiral's Yacht version of a, of a sloop could not carry the class. The class could not be named for the Admiral's Yacht. It would set a bad precedent. So Enchantress is built to a modified standard. Enchantress is built to a modified role. She is massively important as an Admiralty Yacht. Now, what does this do? What is this Admiralty Yacht role? Well, pretty much she spends most of her life wandering around, carrying Admirals around, carrying the First Lord of the Admiralty, the, the political head of the Navy around, to various exercises and various meetings, and acting as... Not so much the flagship for the Admiralty, because of course they would use a bigger ship if they were using a flagship, but their communication ship. The ship which allows them to move around the world. Because, again, what is this era? This is the era before massive airliner travel, before it's very easy to fly around the world. You need a ship to get you places. And for an organisation like the Royal Navy, which sometimes has to have secure meetings and all sorts of things wherever it goes... Relying on liners is not always the most sensible thing to do. Now, this is where you get into your first interesting thing, because, of course, they are a sloop. They are designed, officially, not to exceed 20 knots. So they can come in within the treaty requirements. Article 8 of the London Naval Treaty. And, well, officially, she's designed for a top speed of 18 and 0.75 knots. So a knot and a quarter between her and the 20 knots. Brilliant. She has geared steam turbines to supply two shafts with roughly 3,300 shaft horsepower. Geared steam turbines. Hmm. 18.75 knots. Now, the thing is, with Enchantress, is rather like other vessels in the Royal Navy, which were designed not to exceed 18.75 knots. She seems to sometimes, if you look at her... Her charts and her logs of where she's been, going from A to B, this does not quite add up. It certainly doesn't add up when you consider that the turbines on the Black Swan class, which were 3,600 horsepower as the original, uh, managed to allow them to achieve... 19 knots. Well, that's interesting. 
and the 3,600 shaft horsepower turbines on the Egret class allowed them to achieve 19 and a quarter knots. Yet the 3,300 horsepower um, steam turbines only allowed the Bittens to achieve 18 and three quarters knots. What am I saying here? Well, my main point is this. If you're relying on the official figures for the top speeds of these vessels, then you're letting a lot of discussion of fluid dynamics on those hulls do a lot of work for you in trying to explain what that, that the range of speed difference going on. Either that, or someone is being very careful, there, like, careful to say that they are a clear not less than the, the maximum design for speed they're supposed to be allowed. Consider the crew, roughly 125. Displacement, uh, roughly 1,200 tons. Length, 81 meters. Beam, 11 meters. And again, if we consider the egrets, they are 84 meters in length. So they've gained 3 meters in length. And roughly 300 horsepower. And apparently those that, that 3 meters and that 300 extra horsepower explains a full half a knot difference in their maximum speed. By that margin, the black swans, which are... Well, a, a full 10 meters longer and only marginally pudgier. But again, 300 more horsepower. They only achieve 19 knots extra speed. They only achieve a quarter knot extra speed, 19 knots overall. It's all complicated. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that the Royal Navy spends 1920s and 30s trying to develop their fleet and their escort force. I'm also trying to say that it's quite possible to design a ship to have a maximum speed of 18.75 knots or 19 knots, etc. on a geared turbine. Usually you do it by restricting the gearing. But in wartime, you can t if the gearing is still in place, you can remove the governor that you have on it and your gearing can suddenly... Oh, we have got the higher gear. It's not quite as easy as that. But it's not much more complicated if you have a well-worked-up ship's crew. Now, this class were exceptionally, exceptionally useful. Enchantress and Stork had careers which were pretty much unmatched in some regards, serving the whole way through World War II, doing all sorts of operations. Stork originally is completed as a completely unarmed survey vessel. She only receives her weapons fit after the war begins. She's rushed into harbour and why do you know? All those weapons were just waiting for it. It's just amazing. Another reason why, even though she is built before Bitten, being completed in... launched in 1936, and... Wow. I think she's commissioned... Yes, the same year. She is laid down in June 1935, and she is commissioned in September 1936. It broken up at Troon in 1958. She is an un unmanned, um, an unarmed survey ship, though. So again, doesn't get to be the name ship for the class.
The whole thing for sloops is they are designed for escort and convoy work. They're designed for working with uh, the fleet auxiliary, with merchant ships. They are designed to be capable in terms of anti-aircraft, anti-submarine weapons. And they have a lower priority anti-surface capability. Basically, they're destroyers without the torpedoes. That's what you're looking at. And that's another reason why they're supposed to be slower, because the treaty was basically trying to prevent the Royal Navy building a whole load of sloops and going, they're sloops, honestly, and then war happens. Well, we've just done them with torpedoes. No one had any faith that the Royal Navy wouldn't do that. As for the sloops... Why are they anti-submarine warfare specialists? Why can I make this claim about them? Well, I could talk about HMS Bitten and what she's armed with from the get-go, but actually it's easier to point to the officers who serve her. One of the things that comes up a lot as a naval historian talking about the Royal Navy in the 1920s and 30s is whether the Royal Navy was preparing for a submarine war versus the Germans. Or versus anyone. And... I did enjoy the fact that when I pointed out how the Royal Navy had almost overprepared for dealing with mine warfare because of their experience of World War One versus the Germans, some people went, well, perhaps they showed they weren't as prepared for anti-submarine warfare. No. The Royal Navy had basically turned its sloops, whether they were the remnants of the World War One flag class or the new build vessels, especially in terms of Kingfisher class over to minesweeping, but in terms of Bittens and Enchantress, uh, you know, Bittens, Egrets, all the larger sloops, they're anti summing warfare specialists. And you can tell that by who's placed in charge of them and who's in them and what role they take in exercises. This is Captain Frederick John Walker, or Johnny Walker. One of the most famous anti-submarine warfare specialists the Royal Navy has in World War II. He's also one of the most successful. He's absolutely frigging amazing when it comes to leading his anti-submarine warfare groups and hunting down his opponents. HMS Stork is his flagship for a while in the 36th Escort Group. He then moves on to HMS Starling, which of course is a modified Black Swan class. So, yeah. And there's no surprise that before this... Before he goes to HMS Stork, his command experience is a Shoreham class. Now, the Shoreham class, they were built in the 1930s, early 1930s. HMS Shoreham, Fowey, Biddeford, Rochester, Falmouth, and Milford, Weston, and Dundee. And these ships have a really interesting career when you look them up. But they are the probably, you could argue, although they are preceded by the Hastings and the Bridgewater class, they are the Royal Navy really gearing up for anti-submarine warfare in developing their vessels for it. And the officers they pick to command those ships, to learn their trade in their ships, are the ones they believe are going to lead any anti-submarine warfare role, war. An effort. So. I'm just going to pretty skip back a bit to that one. He also has got HMS Shikari there. Which is another really cool ship. She's an S-class destroyer, which is completed too late to serve in World War One, but provides, well, some of the key backbones of the Royal Navy during the 1920s. She is also used for developing some of the anti-submarine warfare, but she's used as a target direction ship, all sorts of things in her career. But famously... She is also the last ship to leave Dunkirk on the 4th of June 1940. That's the calibre of ship he's put in charge of. And that's the calibre of role they are looking at in terms of developing quality for the Royal Navy. 
Shikari is a good general purpose destroyer. You send an officer to her to command her and to watch what his specialties of skills are. After that point, Walker then goes to become basically a sloop specialist. Get Falmouth, Stork, Starling. So basically, he's sent to a good general purpose vessel. They get to see what his skill set is like. And then they go, right then, you are, we're already developing on an anti-summary warfare, uh, anti warfare track, but we think you're going to be really good at this. So we're going to send you off now. And so they do. Bitten. Bitten is sunk by bombing off Namsos in Norway on the 3rd of April 1940. Now... I would have to add that when we say she sunk, she's hit and damaged. Her hull proves so strong that even with her stern burning like this, she's not going down. So she sunk by a torpedo from the destroyer HMS Janus to make sure she cannot be captured by the enemy. It's felt that she, there's so much damage to her stern, they can't get her home. Which is sad, because considering how useful her sisters were, she would have been very useful. And she was key in helping defend the harbour against air attack with her very good four-inch guns. will say something about it though, that it was only in 2011 that they reported that the ship was actually leaking oil, and they didn't have to do all sorts of things to get it out of her. You can, I'm told, go and swim not far away, not far away from her, you can dive around her, but you have to remember this was a, sh a warship which was sunk with ammunition etc aboard. There is a debate to an extent, how much is down there and whether it would still work. And how much was removed. Because they did try and get some stuff of it before she sank. So, it's... It's a thing which I would personally would be very cautious about diving on. This is one of the things... Whenever someone says things like, we're going to go diving around wrecks, there is my brain, usually as the person who spent his life studying warships, going... You do realise how much firepower is on that thing, don't you? Just how much firepower? Worthwhile thinking about? In the case of... It worked. Of HMS Bitten. Six four-inch AA guns in three twin mounts is usually how we list it. Because the four-inch guns... They are usually listed as being AA weapons. However, again, this is something interesting when you look at the sloops. Their four-inch mounts are able of deflecting down. And just like the four-inch mounts which are fitted onto X position on the tribal class destroyers when they get their anti-air refit upgrade, those guns did prove very effective against certain small ships. Very effective. And that's a fact to consider. Appears to be jumping through the slides quite quickly at the moment. Hmm, we'll see. Anyway. So, the Bitten class. I'm going to start off because this is going to be a series about... There are now going to be a sort of series within... A, or straddling two series in that. Because it's going to go Bitten, Egrets, Black Swans. And I think Hunt class as well are all coming up in a row. Mainly because... I wanted some short videos to send people to to go and look and go, uh, hear the concepts and hear the discussions of these small vessels. And 
so it seems appropriate to start off with the first question. The first question of this sort of little sub-series within two series being... Considering how successful they were, and please go and look up and find out how successful they were, they were really quite good. Enchantress is credited with the destruction of one U-boat solo. Um, it was an Italian Perla class, the Coralla, in December 1942. She served in the Atlantic Mediterranean North Africa. Stork. She's created a destruction of four U-boats. Um, she took part in the sinking of U-131. She rammed U-574 and sunk her. And she depth charged along with HMS Vetch U-252. And depth charged U-634 along with HMS Stonecrop. And those are the ones they confirmed the destruction of. They carried out a lot more attacks and a lot more operations than just those four. Stork was a very, very successful vessel in its service. So, here is the question. How do you think the other powers react if Britain builds more? If they build, let's say, nine sloops a year from 1930, that roughly 1,200 ton vessels officially no faster than not able to go more than 20 knots, usually officially 19 knots or 18 and a three quarter knots, you know, armed. Similarly, because if you look through the different of them, there are very similar armaments that come up. I'd like to hear what you think about them, what you think other powers would have done. How would they have responded to Britain building such a force? Because under the 1930 London Treaty, it was perfectly legitimate for them to do so. And they could have said they were replacing the World War One flower class, which were older ships and have been war emergency build they are it's one of the interesting things is that world war ii flag class are often called a war emergency build but they are started before world war ii begins and definitely not a, as a quick build but not an emergency and the world war one flag class which were a war emergency build are completely forgotten it's, it's, it's quite fun i don't know how do you think the rest of the world reacted do you think some countries would have copied them? Do you think the Commonwealth nations, the Empire nations, might well have built their own, uh, built their own, and got in the act? Do you think America would have built some? You know, how would they have responded to Britain building sloops, or would they not have responded? Would they have just looked at them and go, "Oh, Britain's just building its load of small vessels"? You know what the British Empire is like; they want a gunboat on every on every beachhead. Because especially with their range of roles, in the case of this class, it really does show the roles. You've got one which is completed straight up as a regular sloop to go out and do uh, go out and do those sort of missions or operations. You've got, in the case of Bitten, Stork is completed as a survey ship, Enchantress as an Admiralty yacht. You've got all sorts of roles these vessels could be being completed for. They wouldn't all necessarily look like they were the warship role. Everyone knows they could be, but, you know. Oh, you know, the British, they like to have tons of these ships. So, this is the question I'd, I'd like to hear, because I've talked a lot in the past about what could potentially happen if Britain had built them. It don't cost a lot of money, so they could have built them, could have afforded it, could have crewed them. But the question is, how do you think other nations would have reacted to Britain building them? Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and again, please also comment as to whether or not OBS did a good job. And, uh...
let's uh, skip along, he says. Oof, sad loss. To the year of technology, and what have we got coming up? Oh, that didn't help. I didn't need you to transition at that point. I think you transition on a fixed time period rather than adjusting when I flick through, sh flick through pictures. <laughs> right then, this video will be going out after the tour September. It's, I think it's going out on the Friday of that week. So we've got building the fleets of Actium coming up. And that's going to be a cool one because this time I will pick the correct book straight off. I will pick the correct book. I have this one. Hellenistic Naval Warfare and Warships. 336 to 30 BC. War at Sea from Alexander to Actium by Michael Patassi. And it does look pretty cool. It does certainly have a lot of very cool drawings in it. It's going to be in a book review video when I get back from my all my travels and all my wandering arounds and all my family parties. <sighs> so many family parties. And, uh, yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Sharon. Take care. And I will lead you with this. And I will... Let's see. Thank you very much for watching.